Hi, this is Ken Long with a short discussion on work by Nassim Taleb. Uh, you may know of him from his books Fooled by Randomness and the Black Swan. Uh, he also wrote a nice paper uh, for Edge uh, known as uh, or entitled The Fourth Quadrant Problems and uh, and that's going to be the subject of my discussion tonight. Uh, the bottom line is that a fourth quadrant problem is a problem in this region where statistics not only don't work for you but in which the statistics are downright dangerous because they lead you to make predictions and control systems that are unprepared for the kinds of system shocks that are waiting for you. He likes to use the example of uh, a turkey and you can see right here if we take the vertical axis to be the turkey's um, health and his opinion about uh, the quality of his own life and then the horizontal axis is time. Uh, what happens is right after the turkey is born uh, he has humans taken care of for him and each day uh, they come and they feed him and they take care of him and they uh, give him shots and take care of his health and each day uh, the turkey's quality of life and his opinion about the world around him improves. In fact, if he had a statistics department and a control measures department or using any kinds of measures of effectiveness, uh, it would certainly look like uh, his life is an unqualified good and at some point he'd be entitled to believe um, that the next day is going to look a lot like today until a certain day in November uh, suddenly the turkey's life goes from fantastic to terrible. <clears throat> This is typical of a fourth quadrant problem, and that's the case where the turkey was not aware of the payoff tables that were awaiting him in this world. He made judgments based on the kinds of events and results that he'd already seen and was not aware that there was a complex process underneath uh, this data which uh, was not contained by the experiences that he'd seen so far. You can actually take a look at some of the stock charts of uh, financial institutions over the last three years that look very much like this in terms of er their quarterly and annual earnings. Just before they go bankrupt, everything looked rosy. So really what we, we want to talk about is uh, the nature of, dis of uh, distributions. Now we have uh, my poor drawing of something like a standard normal, uh, nice bulge in the middle and smoothly diminishing tails <coughs> that are symmetrical uh, about the mean. So um, if we had if we plotted the mean it might look something like this and we have a nice orderly uh, baseline here and the area to really pay attention to uh, are out here on the curves and typical of the standard normal is that the tails uh, get thin pretty quickly and as soon as you get out here past uh, oh, uh, 1 and 2 and then uh, three standard deviations now suddenly um, the number of occurrences really go towards zero and there are a lot of risk management strategies in the world of finance and in business that uh, assume that we have normal distributions and that we have thin tails. But that's not the only kind of distribution found in nature. We could have something here that a crude approximation of um, this called a uh, Pearson's type 4 or type 3, a log normal uh, distribution. And what we have on here <coughs> is typical of other kinds of processes that are processes that are also found in nature. Uh, this one is typical of uh, floodplains and certain financial data. And what we have is very constrained left side of the distribution, uh, such as uh, the the height of water in a river. It pretty quickly goes to zero, and and then stops. It can't get drier than zero, uh, and yet. Uh, and then most of the time the, the river stays within his bank so you have this bulge around the mean but there comes some moment 
uh, when the river exceeds its banks. And now suddenly, instead of having a diminishing tail, what we have is something that starts to look more like a power law distribution, and that is uh, a distribution that does not get measurably thinner over time. And now we start seeing things uh, out here at after three standard normal or standard deviations, excuse me. Uh, this thing can go out to ten standard deviations and still have a considerably fatter tail than is found in the standard normal. And, and that's where the danger uh, lies. Now, in financial markets, it's not unusual to see uh, a distribution like this in the red line. And that is more like a binomial distribution, but with a very fat tail. And now what happens <clears throat> is in this region out here, past three standard deviations, this simple difference between these two kinds of different uh, distributions uh, is really crucial to understand. Uh, because what we have is, is this difference in here in this uh, area between the tails makes all the difference. Now suddenly what we're seeing in the blue shaded areas are possibilities for events that happen much more frequently than we were prepared to believe and the consequences can be much greater. <coughs> it's characteristic of these kinds of processes such as earthquakes, avalanches, and the work of Per Bach with the sand piles that uh, the initial conditions do not predict for you when this catastrophic event is going to occur and that's the problem with power law distributions. You get very complex payoffs they're not predictable based on uh, starting conditions and there's no telling even when you're inside of it just how bad it's going to be. Once it gets past three standard deviations now suddenly that thing can just keep going whether that's an avalanche or a financial meltdown the collapse of a complex network system uh, or an earthquake, uh, you don't know how far it's going to go based on the structure uh, in, in the beginning. So you can see things that are very tightly clustered around the, nor uh, around the mean, like this uh, uh, binomial distribution with the fat tails, or it could be something uh, like this distribution down here uh, where we have, uh, we do not have a tight cluster and this is one of the worst ones of all because now you have a significant degree of uh, probabilities that these fat tail events are going to occur and you don't even have the illusion of control that can be found in uh, uh, with data this tightly con constrained. So how do you know when you're in the fourth quadrant? Well let's take a look at uh, what Talib says about the fourth quadrant. <coughs> Pardon me. He constructs the ubiquitous two by two matrix, and he says um, uh, the quadrants across the top uh, can have simple payoffs or complex payoffs. Now that's, that's simpler than he nor than he describes. He actually describes things like simple payoffs, complex payoffs, and then very complex payoffs. So let's take a look at that dimension first. Simple payoffs uh, can often be answered true or false. Um, and they depend on things like uh, prob raw probabilities and you take a probability times the payoff and that's what you get. And then this section here simply tells you the kinds of typical processes that can be found um, under with simple payoffs. Uh, the complex payoffs where we're, we're trying to calculate things like how much uh, also can have linear payoffs uh, where you take a probability and uh, times a payoff and you get these kinds of uh, complex and yet knowable or computable uh, occurrences and then we can do things like uh, insurance underwriting and, and, and uh, tracking climate change and so forth. Very complex payoffs where we're not even sure about the computations however where you have a probability times a power law distribution, now suddenly uh, 
you no longer are able to compute the magnitude of the payoffs. And that's where you see things like uh, payoffs from innovation uh, and convex technologies that, that, uh, are, that cause discontinuous change. <clears throat> so that's the top dimension, simple payoffs versus complex. And then inside the domain, it could be characterized by the kinds of distributions. Thin tails or things like that very uh, uh, standard normal that we looked at. Or distribution twos, these are heavy or unknown tails or uh, unknown characteristic uh, scales. In other words, there's not a, an existing literature on these kinds of payoffs that we can use to compute the possibility of ruin. So when you take the combination of power law distributions or fat tails and very complex payoffs where the second and third order effects are, are not knowable or not known or can't even be estimated, you find yourself in an area where statistics not only are not useful, they're, they are very dangerous and you become very uh, susceptible to black swan events, which is that uh, very rare and yet uh, catastrophic uh, result. In the other three dimensions, statistics uh, are appropriate for managers and leaders and planners to use because they are quite robust to black swans because you can uh, estimate the degree of frequency and the probability of the consequences. And yet our management science that comes from those, those three quadrants uh, are what leads us to over-engineering and taking all the slack out of a system like the global financial network, and then we become susceptible to black swans. So what can you do? And how do you know when you're in a... Uh, uh, fourth quadrant. Well, you know you're in the fourth quadrant now <clears throat> when you're in an area characterized by power law distributions, things like complex systems or complex adaptive systems like dense networks and social networks, places where you have reinforcing feedback loops uh, cause consequences to spiral out of control. They are not dampening feedback they actually uh, they they add energy to each process and that can be characterized by things like uh, tightly coupled nodes in a dense network where there's no slack and the feedback reinforces and it's so complex that we can't compute either causality or the final resting state of the of the network the network can be in a state of continuous flux and so when you have changing networks and changing variables and with nodes entering and leaving the network and relationships changing and the variables themselves changing, you can think of a network as having dynamic variation in the rule sets and that leads you into the fourth quadrant as well. And so now we can think about what do you do when you're, when you're in that fourth quadrant. You need to be designing systems that have resiliency, um, decoupling the, the, the networks, aiming for transparency in rule sets so that we can make cause and effect uh, explicit and we can make explicit the relationships between nodes. We want to look to build slack into a system and so instead of <clears throat> striving for efficiency such as in uh, uh, modern supply chains, well we've engineered all the slack out of those and now we've made everybody in that supply chain vulnerable to discontinuous events. So being robust and resilient is really taking uh, the other side of that coin and trying to become uh, decoupled or introduce slack or to create firewalls and fire breaks that allow us to limit the damage that can happen out of any one section of the network. So we want to have a uh, we have a use now for risk heuristics which are our common sense wisdom that uh, prevents us from believing t in our statistical models too much. We want to resist that kind of efficiency and over-engineering. We want to cultivate the habits of mindfulness and humility in order to continuously monitor in our environment and see when our assumptions that come out of quadrants one, two, and three are beginning to break down as a way perhaps of alerting us to the possibility that we are in avalanche season. <clears throat> 
So those are the main ideas that come out of uh, Taleb's uh, work, Fooled by Randomness, The Black Swan, and The Fourth Quadrant Problems. And that has a lot to say about Ramo's uh, assessment of the world as a complex adaptive system that needs more heuristics and more decoupling and more resiliency. That's the intellectual tradition that his insights are built upon. So that's all from Ken on uh, The Black Swan and The Fourth Quadrant. Thanks.